Today on Art Matters with Mr. Morris, why is Mr. Morris wearing these robes? Da 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 where your training as Jedi artists has reached a point that you are ready to start covering some new and exciting material. Today, we are done talking about the elements of design and we are going to move fully on, storming ahead with the principles of design. This is gonna be a long video, so grab some popcorn, sit back and enjoy it because Mr. Line has returned for a second part to teach you about the principles of design, and we're going to cover two of those to start off. Well, hello, kids. It's Mr. Line back in to teach you about the... The Principles of Design. Ooh. Oh, my. Alright, so we've talked in the past about how the elements are the things in art that make up the picture itself. They're the parts that make the artwork, well, art. But just like Lego blocks, I can't expect to throw them in a big pile and have it form a set. I need to have a plan for that. Let me show you what I mean. I've arranged these three lines to be in a uniform pattern. But if I have them move over here, alright, move over. Norman, seriously, we're, we're filming. Then, they become off-balanced. Now, if I have my friend Ned step up here, and he looks really wide and really tall compared to the other lines, and then I have Norm go ahead and uh, get a little bit longer for me, there we go, and Sally a little bit shorter, and boom! Just like arranging people in a, for a photograph, I've arranged these lines in a way that shows a difference in scale and in space. It gives you a sense of depth in your brain parts. By putting in just two more lines and some lines that make some texture, I can make this look just like a beautiful fence to keep errant livestock away. Oink. Whereas the elements are what the image is made of, the principles of design help us to compose the image in the same way that a music composer composes the music. They arrange what plays when and where it goes in relation to the song. When you talk about the principles of design, what you're really talking about is composing the image. Now you may be wondering, hmm, Mr. Lime, what are the principles of design? Well, good news for you. I'm going to tell you right now. First, there is scale. Then there is balance. Then there is contrast. There's emphasis. There's movement. There's rhythm, space, and harmony. M move, movement, move. We, we got the idea. We, yeah, go, go back in your spot. Well, I'll be, that's a lot of terms to remember, so let's try a studying device to remember what all these terms are. And now we present to you English with Mr. Morris. An acronym is when you take the first letters of a phrase and put them together to create a new word. An initialism, on the other hand, is when you take the first letters of several different words and you still pronounce them as those letters. This has been another presentation by English with Mr. Morris. All right, so we're going to put the first letters of each one of these together in a nice row, and here we go. It's going to spell out Speckmersh. Well, that, that's not too easy to remember. Let, let's try another one. Let's just rearrange these letters. And, uh, all right, here we go. It's Sheckmersh. Well, that, that, that doesn't work either. Uh, let's try one more. Oh, I know it. Let's have it be Mrs. Shreb. Uh, okay, that, that's not really great either. Let's try a different method. Sally, balances, cats, excitedly, 
moving in rhythm, surprisingly, hamburger. Well, that, that's pretty terrible, too. Um, I guess there's no really great way to remember these, uh, other than just going over them a lot. Some of you are thinking, Mr. Line, space is usually listed as an element of design. Well, let me explain to you why I have it as a principle today. We already talked about how the principles are made to help arrange artwork. And you see, space helps us to arrange depth and dimension and even perspective. Space plays a larger role in dealing with arranging a picture than making the picture itself. Not to mention, I can use all the other elements to make a piece of artwork, but I've never seen anyone draw with space to make a picture. And sure, we can talk about positive and negative space, which we will and later on, but these can be better described as value and shape working together than necessarily being a part of an element. Well, I'm really glad that we got this you know, elephant out of the room named space, you know? Taking up, taking up space. Today we're going to be talking about the principles of design. Why, yes, epic sounding disembodied voice, uh, you are correct, but we're really talking about the principle of design known as scale. And scale directly affects how proportion works. So to understand how scale works, let's imagine a house. We know a house is normally really big, and we know that if we're comparing ourselves to the scale of a house, we're really small compared to that. But what happens if we take something really small and we show it next to something that's really big, like this apple? This apple is not to scale, and it makes it so it looks like it's bigger than the house. It makes it look kind of odd. And that's the fun thing about scale, is you can make things bigger or smaller than they normally are, and it affects how the viewer sees the artwork. Let's try scale on a face. So you can see right here I have two eyes on this face, and one is out of scale from the other one. One's much larger, one's much smaller, and it looks kind of odd. Let's fix that. Now I've fixed it, and I'm going to draw on the rest of the face. Scale is one of those places where artists first start noticing that things don't look quite right in their own artwork. Sometimes we draw things too big and sometimes we draw things too small. They're not to scale from the thing that we're actually trying to draw. In this face, it's a lovely face, but you might notice it doesn't look quite right. That's because our eyes aren't that big. It's got giant eyes. So let's bring those back down to scale so that they're equal up with the width of the nose. Now, that I've made this other eye on the right side smaller, now you'll notice that when I cover up the rest of the face, it looks a little bit more like a real face. I'm going to show you the other side real quick so you can see that. And you can see how out of proportion, out of scale, that other eye was. That's right, Jimmy. I should, probably should tell them about the two figures. So, imagine this. I have these two figures, and they're standing here in this white snowy field. Which one's the adult, and which one's the kid? I'll give you a moment. The truth is, is that either one could be the kid, and either one could be the adult. However, because we drew one larger and one smaller, they're in different scale from each other, we just assume that the bigger one is the adult. But as soon as I introduce something else, like this picture of a cow, that, that's not a cow. A car, that's not a car, it's a car. Once I introduce the picture of a car, then you see, it's too small. The people don't look like they can fit into it. But you know, historically artists use scale all the time to change how we see an image. I think it's time to go on a field trip. This, my friends, is in hierarchical scale. This very ancient artwork from ancient Egypt is called the Narmer Palette. And on it, you can see the pharaoh Narmer. And no, he was not a giant. And no, he was not around a bunch of little people. The artists actually made him look bigger. They changed his scale to show his importance. You see, important people were drawn or depicted very large. And less important people like his followers, they were made really small. Scale made it so the artists could tell us a little bit about who the people were that they were depicting in their, in their artwork. Sometimes artists change the scale to make something really small into something really big. 
This is the Freedom Stamp, and it's located right nearby in Cleveland, Ohio. And you can see it's normally something that's really small, but the artist chose to make it very big. It makes a big impact now. In this case, the artist changed the scale of the elephant to make it look awfully strange. Hey, I think that elephant's name is Harold. Huh, that's funny. Actually, my name is Space. My cousin's named Harold. In this beautiful landscape by artist Thomas Cole, you can see the figures of people, and they're really small in scale to the landscape. I think what Thomas Cole was trying to do was show us how powerful and big nature is in comparison with how small us people are. Well, you people, I'm, I'm a line. However, if you remember our talks about perspective, well, then you realize that because the car's smaller, it makes it look farther away. It changes the perspective of our viewpoint. Oink. It's kind of like when Eric Livestock interrupts your video by sticking their heads up close. The scale of its head was larger than those people in that car, and it makes it appear as though it's closer to us. And that, my friends, that is scale, one of our principles of design. That's pretty much what there is to know about scale. I mean, things are big, things are small. You can change the size of those things. Sometimes you do it unintentionally when you're learning how to do art. But the funny thing about scale is, it's kind of subjective. You see, it could be that that pig is just really close, but it could mean that that pig is giant. Houston, we have a problem. We're gonna need a bigger fence. Don't mind me, kids. I'm just trying to balance this frame I'm hanging, trying to get it good and level. And, oh, whoa, 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 getting things to be balanced is sure tough sometimes. All right, there we go. So today our topic is going to be the principle of design known as balance. And that sure looks like it's on the level now. Oh, 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 dagnab it. To explain to you balance, first let's go to this crudely drawn scale. And you can see these two spheres are in balance. Now they're off balance. You see, when I take a small thing and I take a big thing and they're on the scale and they look like they're balanced, but they look wrong, don't they? Like the big object looks like it should tip the scale and it isn't. And it just makes things look all lopsided and all cattywampus. No, I didn't mean to put cats on the screen. I, I said cattywampus. It means askew, crooked. Oh. That's okay. I, I can work with this. You know, Mr. Morris and I, we both believe that art has solid foundation and is measurable and all of those wonderful things. We know that you can teach art and that art is available for everybody. But, you know, there's some gray areas. There's some gray areas where it sure sounds like we're talking about kittens and rainbows. Yes, folks, balance is kind of one of them. You see, as an artist, you aren't always scientifically deciding if a picture looks balanced, it's sometimes a feeling that you feel deep inside. Balance comes from your heart. Oh, a feeling inside. Balance is something you feel. Seriously, Lemmy, would you please just let me sleep? I mean, the singing, it, it can stop. Sorry. Now, the weird singing cat's not entirely wrong, but let me show you some ways that an artist can see if something is, in fact, balanced. To understand balance, first you're going to have to understand the difference between asymmetrical and symmetrical. Symmetrical is something that is the same on both sides. Your face, when I look at it head-on, it's symmetrical. Asymmetrical means that it's not the same on both sides. For example, take a look at this image. Woo! The right and the left don't look anything the same. There are four types of balance. Symmetrical, asymmetrical, radial balance, and crystallographic balance. Crystallographic. That's an awesome name. Now I want to start a band. Mr. Lion and the Crystallographics. Even though in this hard work it's not exactly a mirror image from the right to the left, it's still very symmetrical. This artwork shows us something that's symmetrical. 
It's equal in size and proportion on both sides. This artwork here is showing balance, but it's not true symmetric balance. We can already see that the lady, for instance, is in this bright green dress and the man is in this very dark clothing. The man has a window next to him and the lady has a bed next to him. They're, they're very different shapes. But the thing is that the content that's on the right and the content that's on the left, even though it's not the same, it's not symmetrical, it still shows balance. This is asymmetrical balance. This beautiful stained glass window is showing us radial balance. You can see how when we split it into four equal sized pieces and quarters, each one of those is a mirror image of the other. I can take any of those corners and replace them with another corner and it would still work as a symmetric image. And last, we have crystallographic balance. And you can see how M.C. Escher kind of broke all these fish and all these ducks. If you look carefully, you can see each one of those fits into a perfect little tiny cube. It's basically a grid, and the grid itself is what helps maintain the balance. Within each square of the grid, there's an equal portion of dark and an equal portion of light. Sometimes an artist uses space to also balance things out. If I look at this beautiful picture of this couple as they're standing there, there's a lot of information on the left-hand side. And on the right-hand side, there's a lot of big open space. So much space that it actually balances out because there's enough of information we do see, even though it's far away, that it balances out with the left side, which has all of the concentrated shapes. It just feels balanced. And what's nice about this artwork is the artist had used balance to help give us a sense of movement in the picture. That's a, that's a principle we're going to talk about later. Now I've cropped this image to be a little bit different than the original, and you can see it no longer looks or feels like it's in balance. In fact, some of you are looking at it and you feel uncomfortable. Sometimes artists will actually use imbalance to make the viewer feel, hmm, feels about what's going on in the picture. It has an unsettling feel for our brain as our eye looks at it. The way that you can also check your artwork to see if it's balanced is simply to, I mean, make it so it's balanced. For every object that you put down, you want to put down an object of equal size. If you don't, then one side starts looking heavier. But the other problem is that you can also add too much content. Every time that you use an element, you're technically going to make it heavier in that area. So if you start using too many elements, like shading, let's say, on one side of a picture and the other side's blank, well, it's going to be off balance. So that's everything I've got to say about balance. And I got my picture finally hung up nice and level before this video was over. So sometimes you gotta judge balance by what you can see and what you know, and sometimes you just gotta go by the feeling in your gut. And I guess now you can say you're on level with balance. Ha 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 ha. Man. That's why you always hire professionals to hang pictures. Till next time, I'm Mr. Lion. <laughs> well, I got the upside is now I can fit into those pants from high school again. Don't worry, kids. I'll be back again to teach you more about the principles of design. I hope that you enjoyed the video. Today, your mission, I want you to make a piece of artwork and in that artwork, I want you just to showcase one of the principles of design. It can be one that we didn't cover, or it can be one that was covered in the video. Until next time, remember, be kind to yourself, keep on creating, and may the force be with you, always. I'm Mr. Morris. These are not the droids you are looking for.